Welcome, dear Ori. This lecture I will talk about infection related glomerular nephritis according to the latest published KDEVO 2021 clinical practice guidelines. Guideline for the management of glomerulus. You know now that all uh, nephrotube uh, uh, videos are present on nephrotube channel on YouTube. The PowerPoint on the website. Follow us on uh, at the nephrotube account and Facebook page and join our Facebook. I will talk about infection related glomerular nephritis. I will start by bacteria infection rate GN, followed by short summary about viral infection related GN and parasitic infection related GN. Let's go by the first bacteria infection related GN. You have to know that bacteria infection related GN may present after a latent period of the bacteria infection from days up to several weeks. So you have the bacteria infection in the body, then a latent period of days or weeks you will find the glomerular nephritis or the bacterial infection and the GN are ongoing with each other at the same time. So you may find a latent period between the onset of the infection and the glomerular nephritis or there is glomerular nephritis in the presence of an ongoing acute or, bacteria or chronic bacteria infection. These are the main four uh, categories of bacteria related infection infections that, that we will talk about, post-infectious glomerular nephritis, shunt nephritis, endocarditis related GN, and IgA dominant infection related glomerular nephritis. Let's start by post-infectious glomerular nephritis that was classically called before post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Let's talk, let's us talk, let us talk about the post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, the pathogenesis. Whenever there is a streptococcal infection, Secondly, to the presence of streptococcal infection, there will be uh, there will be streptococcal proteinase, if toxin B, that is released by the bacteria. The antibody will develop. The body will develop antibodies against streptococcal proteinase and toxin B. And then now we have circulating immune complex. Circulating immune complexes will deposit it first the subendothelial and mesangial equations and initiate a local complement activation with recruitment of neutrophils and monocytes. Later on, the antigen and the immune complex will move from the endothelial, endothelial space into the sub-epithelial space causing the famous post-streptococcal uh, hump. So this is the pathogenesis of a streptococcal infection. There is another way other are for how streptococcal infection may harm the glomerulus. Second to the presence of streptococcal infection, there will be nephritis associated with the plasma receptor that will be deposited on the inner side of the glomerular duct and initiate endocapillary proliferation. So this is a more direct mechanism than the antigen antibody mechanism precipitated by the streptococcal proteinase B, and it is not co-localized by immunoglobulin or complement. You will not find immunoglobulin or complement deposition in these cases, while here you will find complement and immunoglobulin. We all know the complement pathway with its three main arms and common pathway at the end. Which arm of this is activated by post streptococcal infection? The alternative pathway may be stimulated by plasma receptor or by the C3 nephritic IgG antibodies present in the sera that was uh, formed to be uh, to act against the uh, streptococcal uh, components. So when alternative pathway is active, you will find it low C3 and mainly normal C4, or sometimes in slight, in little cases, slightly low C4 and post-infectious glomerulonephritis. What I can find in the pathology, I will find diffuse proliferation, and in the immunofluorescence, you will find deposits of C3 in 100% of the cases because C3 activation occurs locally. And you will find some some cases 
some cases with IgG, some cases with IgM, and you will find the deposits scattered in the pathology. And actually, there is a classification to the shape of the uh, immunofluorescence. Uh, but mainly, I will uh, stress in this lecture about the clinical criteria. So, finally, about post infectious glomerulonephritis, who is at risk? Any patient with immunocompromised state or weak immunity, children, elderly, immunocompromised patients. Here, the history is very important the interval time between the infection and the post infectious GN. The post-infectious GN occurs one to two weeks after pharyngitis and four to six weeks after impetite. So there is a latent period between the infection, whatever it's skin infection or pharynx infection, and the appearance of the post-infectious GN. What are the specific laboratory investigations for post-infectious GN? Culture of the skin or tonsil if there is infection. If there is active infection, you can measure anti streptolysin O, anti DNAs B, and finally anti hyaluronase antibodies. Okay. And for sure, for all the types of gourmet frats, you have to assess C3, C4, matoid factors, the cryoglobulins, factor B antibody. Also, you can search for other immunological causes as uh, ENA, ANCA, to exclude. Uh, lupus or uh, sorts of vasculitis. Let's go to the second infection related gromenophrats, which is in the bacterial infection related gromenophrats, which is chantinophrats. What is chantinophrats? Some patients may have a problem in the drainage of CSF, so the neurosurgeon make a shunt, makes a shunt between the CSF ventricles and the atria. This we call ventroatria and ventricles and proteum, this is called ventroproteinial, and the third one called ventricular shoulder, uh, ventricular jugular. The highest rate of infection is the ventricular atrial, and the, uh, the least, sorry, the, uh, the highest, right, the highest rate of infection is the ventricular atrial, and the least infection rate is in the ventricular proteinial, and regarding ventricular jugular, it is in the midway. Sure, he here there will be a history for the patient, the patient, there is a history of the shunt placement. In physical examination, there is no specific signs, and in the laboratory infection, there is no specific lab. You have to make a culture of the blood or CSF fluid or the shunt tip if it is removed. In shunt nephritis, the classical pathway will be activated for the zinc, both, uh, low both C3 and C4. Regarding endocarditis, late glomerular nephritis, this is more common in patients with prosthetic, pro, uh, prosthetic valve, or patients with structural heart disease, or patients with uh, substance abuse, also, also in patients who are immunocompromised, HIV, hepatitis C, diabetes, and so on. Sure, we'll diagnose it, but echo cardiography. The physical examination will show the criteria of endocarditis and the best presentations of endocarditis as skin lesion, splenomegaly, and sure you will find on the heart the nerve plus the fever. Sure, for diagnosis you have to make a blood culture that is positive in about 90-98 of the cases. Which complex pathway is activated in endocarditis associated glomerular nephritis? It is the classical pathway. So you will find both low both C3 and C4 are low in endocarditis associated gene. I have to stress on a point that not every case with infective endocarditis and renal lesion is glomerular nephritis. Not all the cases. Yes, second if infective endocarditis, it may be glomerular nephritis, but there are other causes in patients with infective endocarditis to be presented with uh, to be presented with uh, renal lesion. The first is a patient with infective endocarditis without any renal lesion. The patient started antibiotics, and after time, the creatinine 
starts to raise secondary to the use of antibiotics. So this patient may be acute interstitial nephritis or toxic ATN secondary to the antibiotic use. The third option is the patient presents with acute unilateral frank pain and the frank hematuria. These renal employees secondary to the infective endocarditis in itself and this all what need is uh, conservative measure, conservative treatment. So not every case with infective endocarditis and renal disease is primary nephritis. There are other causes and other possibilities for the case. The third, the fourth type of bacterial infection related to primary nephritis is the IgA dominant infection related GN. This is an item that is totally different from IgA nephropathy. The IgA nephropathy, there is a mucosal infection that uh, precipitates the development of abnormal uh, glycosylated IgA in a patient with abnormal formed IgA. But here there is an uh, infection, mainly it is a staphylococcal infection that occurs in, mainly in diabetics but may occur in others that activate the body to form IgA lesion, IgA uh, antibodies that we will cause the primary effects. So IgA dominant infection related GN may be found in diabetic patients, hypertension, heart disease, malignancy, alcohol abuse will find active infection in the blood or any tissue or any other tissue, not only mucosal infection as the case in IgA nephropathy. Here you can find infection in any place. You have to make culture for the blood and tissues to identify bacterial infection and mostly it is strepto, uh, so, sorry, it is most commonly staphylococcal infection and you may find serum IgA high in these cases. So there is a source of infection in part of the body associated with staphylococcal infection mainly causing the IgA dominant related gene. So in collection, how we will make clinical diagnosis for primary nephritis? Actually by kidney physical history, physical examination, kidney assessment, culture of the blood, urine, or any suspected fluid and tissue, serological examination and test by all its uh, parameters. All of these are often sufficient to support clinical diagnosis in case of bacterial infection. Is there a rule for kidney biopsy in bacterial infection? Actually, there is uncertain, the, 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 the rule of biopsy in, uh, uh, in infection rate GN is uncertain, is not indicated mainly especially in some situations based on case by case that we will mention later. What about the prognosis and the treatment of infection related bacteria infection related GM? Regarding post infectious GN it carries a good prognosis in children but maybe uh, yeah, but you may find persistent albuminuria in some cases and also persistent hematuria in some cases. It may post infectious it may carry uh, less uh, favorable prognosis in elderly. So in elderly kidney prognosis is poor and uh, development of persistent proteinuria may be present with mortality up to 20%. Shunt nephritis, the outcome mainly is good if you removed the shunt and the treat the infection. Endocarditis related GM also the prognosis is good. IgA dominant infection related GM carries the worst prognosis. Dialysis is frequent, recovery is guarded with less than 20% returning to pre morbid level of kidney function. How to treat the main treat? I could I will collect it here. Treatment of related germane rats. The general treatment, control edema, proteinuria, hypertension, immunosuppression is generally inadvisable. It is enough to eradicate the infection by the use of antibiotics and the removal of foreign buds. In infective endocarditis, some patients may need valve replacement. So avoid treat general treatment. Use antibiotics, immunosuppression is generally inadvisable. 
What about the course? You have to follow up your case. What about the course? In post infectious GN, we said, especially in children, the outcome is good. But if, uh, and we said also that there may be persistent albuminuria and persistent hematuria, although that the patient is in uh, remission. But the persistence of low C3 beyond the 12th week is an indication for kidney virus. Because this patient may be diagnosed as C C3GN. And we mentioned that in the lecture of membranoproliferative patterns of glomerulonephritis. So if C3 is still low after 12 weeks of the diagnosis and treatment of patients with post infectious glomerulonephritis, you have to biopsy the patient. He may be C3GN and also he may be lupus, systemic lupus. In, in the epidemic post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, you, you may use mass antimicrobial to eradicate the infection. An important point in shunt nephritis that <coughs> some of them, for unclear mechanism, developed anca vasculitis. So you have to follow up the patient because he may develop B3, B, BR3 anca vasculitis later on. In endocarditis related glomerular nephritis, we said that the prognosis is good. IgA dominant glomerular nephritis, we said that the prognosis is bad, especially in diabetic patients. <coughs> okay, that's what was about bacterial infection related GN. Let's go through viral infection related GN. <coughs> Just short snaps. I will start by talking about treatment of hepatitis E virus in a patient with glomerular disease. Any patient <coughs> with chronic hepatitis B virus infection is at risk of developing kidney failure. <coughs> so, any patient with hepatitis B virus infection and glomerular nephritis and his hepatitis B virus DNA level is more than 2,000 international units per mil, this patient must be treated with nucleocytides as recommended for general population. So if you have glomerular nephritis in the presence of hepatitis B virus infection with more than 2,000 international units per mil, you must treat these patients with nucleocytides and there is no rule for begylated interferon. Can I use immunosuppression in this case? No. Immunosuppressions must not be used in patients of hepatitis B virus. <coughs> no sacrofosamide, no rituximab, no role for any immunosuppression in this case because immunosuppressions may increase the replication of hepatitis B virus and the condition becomes worse. Is there any role for plasma exchange? Uh, yeah, actually, it, it is based, it is case by case discussed. Plasma exchange may be tried in patients with accompanying cryoglobinemic vasculitis with hepatitis B virus. Regarding HIV infection, this map shows the global distribution of CKD associated with hepatitis with sorry uh, HIV infection. Many factors may increase the possibility of kidney disease. Uh, development secondary HIV starting by apple 1 G1 and G2 carries the risk carry the risk socio demographic states and many other cofactors especially co-infections some infections if they are present you increase increase the possibility of chronic kidney disease uh, occurrence secondary to HIV infection what are the spectrum of kidney disease that be seen on kidney biopsy in patients of with hepatitis HIV with HIV sorry with HIV. The most common biopsy found in patients with HIV is immune complex GN. The secondary common is diabetic, and the HIV associated nephropathy is the third. So the pure HIV associated nephropathy is the third spectrum that can be seen in patients with HIV and kidney disease. 
followed by tenofovirtuxisti, FSGS, global sclerosis, ATN, any diseases not related to HIV. So biopsy is important. Biopsy is very important in patients with HIV and renal injury to know which spectrum of these is the cause to target the therapy to release. Because it is not only HIV associated nephropathy that may occur when there is HIV plus kidney lesion or kidney disease. Treatment of HIV it is recommended for all the patients, whatever the CD4 account. All patients must receive antiretroviral treatment. Is there a rule for uh, uh, immunosup uh, glucocorticoids? Glucocorticoids as an adjuvant therapy, adjuvant, uh, adjuvant therapy for HIV can be used, but its use can be on a case by case as the risk and the benefits are answered. After we finished the talk about viral infection, we talked about hepatitis B and HIV. Let's talk in fast also about parasitic related infection. Here I am talking about schistosomiasis. You know that schistosomiasis is associated with hepatic fibrosis. So any patient with hepatic fibrosis with schistosomiasis must be monitored for the development of kidney disease. Any patients with hepatic fibrosis from schistosom uh, schistosomiasis must be monitored for the development of kidney disease. Also, any patient with history of schistosomiasis and elevated serum creatinine or hematuria, you have to evaluate this patient for bladder cancer or urinary tract obstruction. So any patient with schistosomiasis history Elevated creatine hematuria search for bladder cancer or urinary tract obstruction. The most important in the treatment of schistosoma, uh, nephropathy infection, is to find the co infections if there is co infection. Because if there is co infection, the management of the case will never be complete except after treatment of both the schistosoma and the co infection. Search especially for Salmonella, Hepatitis B virus, Hepatitis C virus, and HIV. Kidney biopsy is important in schistosoma and associated gluconeophrites because we may find different spectrum of the pathologies according to a frank classification. If it is only the schistosoma which affects the kidney or schistosoma with other co-infection, and your treatment will be targeted to the co-infection and the schistosoma, treat schistosoma by braziquantel or oxaminiquine by the full sufficient dose and to the full sufficient duration to eradicate the case and no rule, no indication for immunosuppressive agents in schistosoma nephrology. What about malaria? In front of you, the spectrum or the distribution of anemia worldwide is more common in Africa. How malaria may affect the kidney? Malaria may affect the kidney finally in two common pathways. The first pathway, malaria will cause erythrocyte parasitism. This will initiate immune response and glomerulonephritis. The second pathway depends on more in, on cytoadherence, cytokine and inflammatory mediators, causing hypovolemia, hemolysis, rhabdomyolysis, hyperviscosity, Jones hyperbilirubinemia, DIC, hepatorenal syndrome, all of key these will cause decreased renal perfusion, acute tubular necrosis, and acute kidney injury. So, in general, malaria will cause immune complex GN or cause acute tubular necrosis. Which is more common? It is the acute tubular necrosis and acute kidney injury. So, the treatment is generally supportive plus giving the uh, treatment of uh, malaria. There are four stages for in the biopsy in the biopsy of malaria nephropathy. Just a pathological staging of a curtain malaria, started by focal segmental, with mild degree, then with moderate degree, then diffuse or segmental lesions with interstitial tubular changes, and the final stage for 
the more chronic shape, which is marked sclerosis and interstitial tubular atrophy. So the biopsy may give you an idea about the prognosis if the patient will respond to the treatment or the patient is more near to the chronicity if the patient is at stage 3 or 4. Patients with malaria infection and GN, as we said, should be treated with antiparasitic agent, sufficient dose and duration to eradicate the organism, not only from the blood, but also from the hepatosporinic sites. No indication, as the case in schistosoma, the same is in, in malaria, no indication for use of immunosuppressive agents in malaria. Thank you for watching this video and see you again in another video. Bye-bye.